concussion coming off that thing standing right here. All right. What I have before you here are what I feel to be the best of the best available modern tactical 556 or 223 rifles. Now, obviously not every conceivable drool enticing contraption of terror is represented, but for the most part, the pinnacle of built for battle carbines in this caliber are present. And what do I mean by modern? Well, I've scratched anything that didn't come to the market within the last 15 years. So these truly are the latest and greatest of anything available on the civilian market. So without delay, the candidates are the Beretta ARX100, the IWI Tavor, CZ Bren 805, FN Scar 16S, FN FS2000, Remington ACR, Keltec RDB, and the Robinson XCR. For the sake of brevity, this is by no means a complete review on each rifle. I've done a full review on some of these and maybe I'll hit up a couple more in the future. But for now, I'm just gonna hit on the major aspects that elevate one above another. And to help from overwhelming my little mind, I'm gonna break down this comparison gun by gun and hopefully pick a winner at the end. My primary guidelines for evaluation are reliability and ruggedness, shooting characteristics, accuracy, using both plinking ammo and match grade average together, ergonomics, weight, balance, aesthetics, modularity, and customization. I really do try to stay very objective, and I personally own each of these guns to give them a fair shake, but I certainly have my preferences as well, and they may differ from yours. I'll share my reasoning behind my opinions, but I'm sure I'll manage to offend a few millennials in the process. If you came to a different conclusion, cool, share it in the comments. Other points of view and thought out conclusions are always welcome. We're all learning together, right? Also, before the comments start pouring in, no, I'm not including any ARs or variants thereof. Again, I'm sticking with rifles that were introduced to the market at least within the last 15 years. Yes, I absolutely love ARs, and I'm sure yours would continue to operate with marbles jammed right into the ejection port. We're not going there. Virtually everything's already been said about the AR platform, and though constantly improving upon and updated, the AR is an old design. Even gas piston versions like LWRC, POF, HK, or other departures like the SIG MCX, they're very similar. So the very closest thing to an AR that I led into this little comparison would be the XCR. But it's a large enough departure from the platform to be called a new rifle in my book. All right, point made. No ARs, no AR types in this video. And again, I'm only looking at the 5.56 caliber. Larger calibers are a different ball game for another time. On to the meat and potatoes. This has been my experience with each of these rifles, which again, I personally own. First up, the Beretta ARX100. Now, what do you see when you first glance at the ARX100? Well, me, I can't help but think of a fish when I look at this butt ugly little chunker. And admittedly, when I first got it into my hands, I wasn't that impressed. It feels like a toy, and the stock is the worst little Italian man concoction I've ever seen. It rides so low it requires more of a chin weld than cheek. And the length of pull would be perfect if you were a velociraptor. Seriously, who has arms short enough to require a length of pull like this? It's ridiculous. The folding mechanism on the stock works fine, but you feel like a strong breeze might break it. Obviously, a lot of these little complaints are geared to my personal ergonomics and preference issues, but they're also generally undesirable characteristics. That said, believe it or not, I'm actually starting to grow to like this little hobbit gun. Then the more I look at it, the more it grows on me despite its salmon-like resemblance. But as far as function, it's unbelievable and stacks up with the very best. And there's definitely no rifle that can change barrels or from right to lefty with such ease and speed. For a left-handed shooter, this is the way to go as you can swap the charging handle and even ejection pattern sides on the fly. And the convenient controls are completely ambidextrous everything. If only more calibers and barrel lengths were available, this would be as modular as it comes. But that's a big if as that support hasn't really taken off and is probably unlikely to do so in the future. So if you can live with the midget man ergonomics, chintzy fill and rough edges, like on those cursed sharp sling attachment points that keep my band-aid supply running dry. If you can deal with all that, you may become a fan. And the cheap feeling polymer certainly has its advantages, making for a slim seven pound lightweight that balances very evenly. And it still performs to military standards, no doubt. The recoil impulse is sharp but brief. And while it likes to swing off target a little more than some of these others, 5.56 is easily managed in any gun anyway. It's hard to say how this outer shell will hold up to abuse, but so far so good. Onto the trigger, it's certainly nothing to write home about, but certainly not the worst of these tactical carbines. And the accuracy was good, not great, but good, averaging around two MOA. But I gotta say it again, the reliability of the ARX100 is its major selling point and has been the biggest surprise for me. 
I've never seen it falter, and testing around the world continues to impress as it beats out more proven rifles and torture tests. It also says a lot that every time I shoot the ARX100, I like it that much more. I can't deny that this would be an excellent choice as your one and only go-to carving. On to the IWI Tavor. By most metrics, the Tavor is the king of bullpups today. Commercial and military success will keep it in the gauntlet for a long time to come. Already new versions like the X95 show that interest remains high, and for good reason. The Israelis don't dilly-dally around, and neither does their little bullpup beast here. The Tavor's polymer has a nice, grippy, rubbery texture. Though at first blush, it certainly doesn't appear on par with the price point. But it's durable, and the entire chassis feels robust. The weight goes right along with that theme. It's a heavy little bugger at about 8 pounds. But being a bullpup, the weight remains close to your body, and is maneuvered easier than rifles a full pound lighter. Plus, felt recoil is more easily controlled without reduced fulcrum. The Tavor does fall victim to the disparaged bullpup trigger. It's heavy, gritty, and creepy, but excellent aftermarket triggers are available. Toss in a Geisley or Timney and everything else is squared away. The controls are comfy and natural, and with a little practice, mag changes are impressively fast. I mean fast as anything else out there. Though you are limited to a one-size-fits-all length of pull and cheek weld. But I can live with that, as it's made for a normal-sized human being. For a bullpup, the accuracy is satisfying, printing around just over 2 MOA, and it's easy to outfit this Barbie doll with a wide selection of aftermarket parts. Now I do have to note, if you enjoy shooting suppressed, this is one of your worst options, as you'll be eating more gas than a human can handle with the obnoxious blowback, so that could be a negative. But overall, this is a fly looking little gun, and in the end, it's a true military adaptation, and won't fail you in even the most taxing environments. Okay, here we have the CZ Bren 805. CZ is definitely Come up with a winner with this plagiarized check scar. The build quality, smooth operation, ergos, and reliability are on par with or even exceed the best you can find. It really is impressive. You'd think you're looking at a rifle costing twice as much as you paid for it. We're talking flawless machining and molding and an excellent finish that should wear hard. And the bolt does operate slick as snot and it really helps with that smooth shooting impulse. The safety selector is a little bit different than I'm used to, but it functions great after a few repetitions. And though the 805 isn't entirely proven being a new gun, the operating mechanics are and I expect the reliability to remain 100%. There were a few strange oversights in the design of the 805. It's definitely too heavy at over 8 pounds, especially when considering its predecessors. But it does balance well and doesn't feel fatiguing while shooting. But then there's a the head scratching decision to leave out a bolt release. It increases reload time and it's not great economy of motion. I actually like reciprocating charging handles like you find on here. They're great for simplicity and the control it gives you, but that may bother some of you shooters as well. Another area it excels is the trigger. It's probably the best of the bunch here. It's an awesome two-stage, four to five pound pull with very little grit and manageable creep and slack. Certainly not match grade, but it's good with a clean break. And it's the only gun here that I'm happy shooting without a trigger upgrade. And maybe partly due to that trigger, it's also proven to be very accurate around 1.5 MOA. Because it's so new, there isn't an overabundance of third-party support, but it's definitely coming. And the excitement for the 805 is only building. I expect it to be fully covered for the foreseeable future. Finally, this thing is beautiful. Robbing the scar of its looks isn't a bad thing. And the build quality, again, really is top of class. I love seeing additions like the CZ Bren 805. So naturally, it's time to move on to the FN Scar 16S. The Scar platform holds a special place in my heart, a true modern day legend, especially the 17S, which is technically what I have right here. They're virtually identical, other than the caliber. Parts are about 80% swappable. So where do I start? The rifle was plain designed by geniuses. For a rifle like this, the weight of the 16S is exceptional at just over 7 pounds. So you can make it your constant companion, and the balance is perfect. The felt recoil is practically null despite the slight double impulse you get with that large carrier. That's part due to the design of the gun, and part the excellent PWS brake that's included. And as for accuracy, also excellent at just over 1 MOA. And all that despite one of the worst stock triggers I've ever felt. It's heavy like sin, gritty like sandpaper, and creepy as your basement dwelling neighbor. Needless to say, I feel the Geisley trigger is a must in the SCAR. But a beautiful thing that Geisley is. The SCAR's ergonomics are second only to your living room lazy boy, with everything placed for speed and function, including AR style controls for lefties and righties, only lacking an ambi bolt release. I think the stock is very comfortable, but it's also one of the only complaints users have had with the SCAR, as there's been a few 
few reports from the field of broken stock latches, but there's major third party support because of the great commercial success of the 16S. So remedy that stock latch you can, or with an available adapter, you can attach any other stock your little heart desires. And the customization doesn't stop there. As far as 5.56 rifles go, only an AR has more options regarding parts and accessories. But even straight out of the box, the Scar rocks renowned aesthetics. Even your 12 year old Call of Duty obsessed booger eating cousin will recognize the FN Scar. So with this firearm, looks can kill. I even like the mishmash concoction of colors of the FDE version. Though I know it bugs some OCD guys out there, I think it looks cool. And in the end, the reliability is heavily proven, probably as much as these other guns combined, and the durability is so impressive for a lightweight carbine. It's extremely unlikely your scar will ever throw a fit, though your bank account might. But if you'll spare no expense, the 16S will do anything you ask of it. Now for the other FN, the FS2000. Looking like something straight out of Halo, this is truly an interesting firearm. The FS2000 may be the most fully sealed system I've ever seen. They really did take it to the extreme dream, sometimes to the detriment of the system as a whole. It's locked down like a decontamination chamber. <laughs> it does work, but it's as hard to get in and out of as a cramped parking spot. Though for you clean freaks out there operating in dust storms, the FS2000 will more than likely keep your rifle's guts cleaner than anything else. Just take a look, there is absolutely nowhere for crap to get in. Now I'm not a big thumbhole fan, and the P90 Ergos are dated like your bull cut from the 5th grade, and it does feel really thick and clunky, though comfy no doubt. And I've gotta confess, this is the slowest rifle out of the bunch into action. The difficulty in seating mags and the lack of a last round bolt hole open or bolt release is on par with an AK mag swap, though less fun than an AK without that calm block action. Also, this is the only gun out of all of these that's going to limit you to GI mags only, as any non-standard contours like on a P mag won't work with the rubber mag well wipes inside the FS2000. Then there's the craptacular trigger that's going to wear your index finger out after the first mag is through anyway, so maybe that mag change won't be so necessary after all. All kidding aside, this FN oddity is so different that it's cool, and it does sport that proven FN reliability. So as a hell and back option, this is great. It shoots with a similar to the Tavor bullpup controllability, and the weight's almost the same at 7.9 pounds. Again though, that weight's hardly noticeable in this short configuration, and again, it's easily maneuvered. But I do have to say the accuracy lags behind a little bit at just under 3 MOA in my experience. Not bad, and that's not really what it was designed for anyway. Oh man, but this thing is iconic. Anyone into guns is going to immediately recognize it. And to top it off, these things are no longer being produced by FN, and that rarity is starting to make that price skyrocket. It really is a soon to be collector's piece. So get it while you can. It's built to last and this kind of rugged reliability is hard to come by these days. On to the Remington ACR. Unfortunately it certainly fell short of the once grandiose expectations largely due to its launch failures and subsequent commercial disappointment. Plus the ACR has some weight and balance issues. Otherwise with the initial release issues ironed out it's absolute beast mode and it could be had for a steal of a deal if you know where to look. And it took the complete opposite approach of the FS2000 when it comes to keeping your internals clean. What they did with the ACR is open it up for ingress with the goal of easier egress. As you can see right here, there's gaping holes even with the carrier closed. And this was completely intentional and testing showed that it cleared debris away very effectively. Two polar opposite approaches that both seem to work. The ergonomics on the ACR are genuinely amazing. The stock is near perfect, and the familiar AR feel to the gun with fully ambi controls is great, even if the selector lever likes to rub your hand a little raw. <laughs> but truly, many of the best features of similar rifles were implemented into the ACR. And besides the very earliest serial numbers, these things are extremely reliable. And if only they were a little bit lighter, they'd be the business. During testing, I was averaging about 2 MOA with various loads. And this again with a stock trigger that's less than impressive. It seems to be an ongoing theme with these modern tactical rifles. <laughs> Apparently somebody mandated they all need to have sucky triggers to balance out otherwise very impressive resumes. So again, the Geisley trigger is a major aid for anybody planning to shoot for precision or speed. As far as felt recoil, the ACR does trail slightly behind the Scar or Bren, but it's still a very flat shooter. Maybe the unnatural nose heaviness of the ACR aids this. And even with the polymer handguard of the basic version, it's still very front heavy, though improved. So again, it's not overly conducive to sustain ready position as it's going to wear you out. And because the ACR is a dying breed, the aftermarket is drying up as well. Plus, Remington really never fully backed the product to begin with, and promised caliber conversions and other accessories were never released. 
Despite these negatives, it's hard to ignore how fun it is to shoot. It really is built to the highest standards and you can feel it. There's no denying it's a gorgeous rifle and who knows, maybe in the future it'll have a resurgence, but that's likely wishful thinking. Next up, the Robinson XCR. The XCR is a bit of an afterthought for many of us. Perhaps it feels too AR to draw attention or properly distinguish it. Whatever the case, you just might be missing out. It provides some great proven piston action along with some solid modularity. For those looking to mix up their arsenal, this would be a noteworthy addition since it does look just different enough from an AR to draw some attention. And when first released, the XCR was no doubt innovative, though as time goes on it has lost the lead with some of these newer rifles. Still the function of this ambi bolt release here was groundbreaking, and I certainly love the solid build and lockup of the folding stock mechanism. This beautiful monolithic upper is wonderfully machined, making for an extremely robust build, and the ergonomics are pretty much identical to an AR, so it's an easy transition for a lot of people. The XCR did have some early quality control issues, and that can often destroy a gun as we saw with the ACR, but to their credit, Robinson Armament, despite being a small company, has fully supported their prized jewel, and personally I've never had an issue with my XCR. Its trigger feels slightly better than mil spec, and the accuracy falls in the middle of the pack around 2 MOA, though that will depend on your barrel selection. So however configured heavy or light contours, it's an acceptable, albeit unimpressive 7.5 pounds and up. I wouldn't say it feels noticeably heavy though. And my function is great and it's proven to be a solid option as time goes on. They have been noted to have some issues with steel cased ammunition. I did have one case head separation and those are no fun, but keep the gas settings low and you should be okay. And it eats brass like candy. The shot impulse is very similar to an AR and with a good break it can be tuned beautifully. Robinson continues to release updated models and the latest reports are very promising. In the end, if not forgetting the blank firing adapters when submitting for the SCAR competition, who knows, maybe the XCR would be a front runner in the industry. Sadly, this kind of forgetfulness has plagued the XCR, hindering an otherwise excellent platform. Last and maybe least, we have the kel RDB. For me, the RDB has a while to go before it proves itself. And kel reputation as a hard to find budget minded yet innovative brand won't do it any favors. I regard most of my kel as sporting purposes only guns. But before shooting my RDB, my first impression, Man, this thing looks and feels terrific. I was inclined to think that this thing was more serious business than any other kel to date. And now I mock myself for even considering this as a true go-to-war option. It failed within the first 50 rounds, and I mean a hard, epic fail. <laughs> this was no stovepipe, no failure to feed during a break-in period. The hammer assembly literally straight up broke, putting it completely out of commission. And I've yet to hear back from kel customer service over the last two weeks. And that might be why I'm slightly more bitter than I probably should be. I just hope this doesn't indicate a customer service nightmare and a lengthy repair. I mean, this thing was brand new out of the box. Unacceptable. And I understand this isn't the first rifle to have early release growing pains. A couple others in this video had problems initially. And my RDB does have a serial number in the 300 range. It's a very early release. I'll definitely be giving it some more love when it's running right, but this is not a good sign. And I wish I could say it's an anomaly with the kel I've owned. <laughs> Let's get to a few positives though. The RDB is a wonderful light seven pounds. And the ergos are generally solid with a sleek and slender profile with accessible controls, though I didn't really like the mag release, it being one of the least comfortable designs for the back of my hand I've encountered. Sadly, before I went down, I didn't get the chance to test accuracy, and it hardly seems rugged or even reliable at this point. But the few shots I got out of it were true to the easily controlled bullpup design, with a snappy but flat impulse. And I'm very impressed with the trigger. I'd say it's the best of any stock bullpup carbine I've ever seen. So the RDB is full of great features. I'm almost always intrigued by kel designs. They're forward thinking and they bring new, interesting things to the market. The downward ejecting system itself is a welcome feature and one that I haven't seen since the PS90. Now judging by past kel releases, third party support will be there but probably more scarce than other options. But this gun is new enough that it's yet to be determined. I am a little jaded right now and should probably hold off on saying anything more until I get it fixed and have some time to reevaluate. I had really high hopes for the RDB and I will definitely give an update after it's up and running again. So let's briefly give my final thoughts on each of these rifles. For the FS2000, the sloth-like manual of arms is its ultimate downfall, and the trigger isn't doing it any favors. It's certainly unique and special in many ways, and it's built to go hard as the beefy components suggest. But again, that speed and the clunky ergos drop it down my list. The XCR brought some great features to the table when it was first introduced. The location and function of the ambi bolt release again is still my favorite. <laughs> Just keep your allen screws tight and avoid steel cased ammunition and you're good. Unfortunately for a go-to rifle, I want it to eat up everything and take a beating. 
As for the RDB, I almost regret putting it in the competition, and I almost didn't. My first inclination was to put it on the back burner, as it's probably not built to the same standards as these other proven military adapted firearms. And I should have stuck with that gut feeling. As it stands right now in a self-defense scenario, I wouldn't give the RDB to the guy who stole my lunch money, let alone allow it to defend my family. Despite some promising features, so far, Big disappointment. I hope they take care of it and Keltec changes my mind. The ACR's commercial failure breaks the bank and dooms the rifle. Though it is now excellent in most ways, I still love to shoot it and I trust it. It really is one of the most ergonomic rifles available, but it has no real user support or company backing and it's on the heavy side with awkward balance. Okay, so I really want to love the ARX100. It's still largely aesthetically unattractive to me. And the ergos are just plain stupid and hard to swallow when compared to other modern rifles. Ambidextrous and modular, awesome contents, and a less than desirable package. Now on to the big winners. Three of these modern marvels stand out above the rest for me, and each for a slightly different reason. So first for hard-hitting value and rising star potential, the Bren rises to the top. It is too heavy when compared to the others, and the lack of a bolt release is hard to explain. But dollar to dollar, it's a steal. The quality craftsmanship and materials is amazing, and it runs as reliably as Old Faithful. Amazing shooter, and the smoothest operation you'll find. I'd feel comfortable with the 805 by my side in any situation. Then we have the IW UI Tavor. For tight quarters where you need a compact and enduring bullpup, the Tavor is the best option. You retain rifle length ballistics in an effective and shrunken form. And I don't know of a more reliable bullpup out there. The weight is manageable and the ergonomics are incredible with a little practice. X95 or SAR, you're set. And finally, for overall use, when money is not a concern, with cream of the crop ergonomics, shootability, customization, weight, accuracy, and overall battlefield proven reliability, the SCAR 16S takes the blue ribbon. I'm still waiting for something better to come along, and it will eventually happen, but for me, it's still my top choice bar none. It's a tack driver that feels so good and never stops chucking brass. I shoot SCARs the most out of all of these, and there's a reason for it. It's that good. In my opinion, it's one of the best firearms in existence. So there you have it. My conclusions through my experience with each of my modern 5.56 rifles. They all have positives, they all have negatives, and maybe you see some of their qualities in a different light than I do, so leave it in the comments. In the 5.56 caliber, what is your favorite modern fighting rifle? Thanks for checking it out guys, stay safe out there.